In the classical yoga text, the Yoga Sutras, the author, the sage Badanjali, mentions a path to liberation through surrender to God. Surrender to God. And as a standalone sutra, of course, it's a little bit out of context, but it is essential to focus on the two words, surrender and God, so we can get a deeper understanding of its meaning and significance because it can be, and most often in my experience, is misunderstood. Someone can read that sutra by itself and just think, oh, it's a religious text. It's asking you to refer, so it's asking you to surrender to a Hindu type God. And so the Yoga Sutras is not for me. But you can't judge a whole yogic culture or a, uh, a book even by reading one sutra you have to look at the broader culture to provide context. We're gonna look at the words surrender and God, not necessarily to understand what they mean, but to understand what they do not mean. And in my experience, reading with a clearer mind and uh, kind of trying to erase our misconceptions will help us understand what it means better over time. So we're not necessarily looking for an understanding, we're looking for just a little clarity. Know what I mean? So my understanding of this sutra suggests that surrender is an innate quality that we can cultivate within ourselves. Cultivate, that's such a yogic word, isn't it? So Patanjali encourages us to uh, surrender, but it's more about surrendering our ego. So surrender is not an action, it's something that kind of becomes a part of who we are. So if you're intentionally trying to surrender, you're missing the point completely. If you're following the path of the Yoga Sutras, you arrive to a stage where surrender or surrendering is part of who you are. It's very similar to meditation. See, meditation is really misunderstood in, in its yogic context anyway. So speaking from a yogic perspective, you can't meditate because meditating is an action. You can only become meditative. So as a consequence of physical yoga practice and breathing, you come to a stage where you can become more meditative. And I see surrender as the same. You can't sit there in a yoga class and think, right, now I'm going to surrender. You can in the, in the idea that kind of surrender yourself when you're doing a forward fold, for example, but when it comes to the mind, you can't surrender. It would take a lifetime of uh, immersion and discipline to the point where you would find yourself surrendering because it's who you are, not what you feel you should be doing. But then is saying that at some stage, we recognize something within ourselves and we're able to surrender what that is. You should arrive to Sutra 1.23. Is that right? And read that you can find this state of uh, like no mind through surrender to God and feel like it's something you've written for yourself because that's where you are. It's not really for intellectual debate. So if you sit there and read this sutra and think, oh, I wonder what it means. What is Badanjali talking about when he asked me to surrender to God? The very fact that it's become intellectual suggests that it's not for you. It should be existential. And I think this word uh, God is very, very misunderstood, especially when it's taken out of context. And what I think Patanjali is telling us is that we will be able to experience this no mind via surrender to God when we have the capacity to surrender when it's who we are and what God means in that, in that context is what God, whatever that means to us at that time. It could be religious. So if you're a Muslim or a Christian or a Hindu, you will find that you can achieve no mind through surrender to this God. Or you can look at it more yogically and think if we are inherently divine, um, if God exists within us all, if 
we are made of the same stuff as the cosmos, as the universe, we're just honoring that divinity. So when we can recognize that, when we can feel that rather than debate it intellectually, we can then understand that sutra, but we won't understand it because it's something we are. Do you know what I mean? And then opens the gates for no mind, or an absence of mind, or a stillness of mind, which is the eventual goal of yoga, the destination. Any of that makes sense, because it makes complete sense to me. As a summary, if you're reading something uh, yogic, even the Bhagavad Gita, uh, which it can, argued, it can be argued is a Hindu text, but it can also be argued as very yogic text. If something doesn't make sense, and if you disagree with something, it's because that's not written for you. It's not for you, may never be for you, or it's not for you or me based on where we are in our practice or in our journey as a seeker. If it makes sense, it's because it completely resonates with who you are. Oh man, did I just say resonate? Come on Zia, you're better than that. I think I've made some sense. It, it, anyway. If you'd like me to elaborate on this a little bit more, if you'd like me to uh, help enlighten you at the same time as I'm trying to enlighten myself, you can join our yoga teacher training. For those of you who don't know, we were nominated by Om Yoga Magazine as one of the best yoga teacher trainings in this country, which is an absolute honor. I'm hoping by the time you're watching this, we've uh, gone to the awards. Uh, who knows if we're going to win, it's up to, you know, not God. Someone said, so here you just need to manifest the award and, and you'll get it. Why do yoga people love the word manifest as well? Don't get it. Anyway, more information is available below. Have a, a little read, um, get in touch, see how our senior yoga teacher Paul, my lovely wife and yoga therapist Laura, and I can help you realize your dream of becoming a yoga teacher and hopefully you can go on to influence uh, so many lives um, as yoga teachers uh, appear to do. I'm out of here.